You're listening to Sasquatch Syndicate. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. And all the ape believers don't want any of the paranormal believers to say anything because they're all whacked and screwed up and we don't want them. And all the paranormal believers don't want to go to the ape believers saying, well, you're all closed minded. You're not open to the fact that that it does this and it does that. And I look over my left shoulder and this creature is running through the woods and it's bulldozing the brush down. And I knew, man, this thing is going to get me. along with Paul in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for listening and those following us at SasquatchSyndicate.com and on our social media outlets. For those participating in the Sasquatch Syndicate monthly t-shirt giveaway, this month's winner was Mary Jamison from Yakima, Washington. So Mary, congratulations. Thanks for listening to the show. And please check your Facebook for winter notification. Happy April, everyone. We hope everybody's enjoying your spring. For those moving over from 1340K Talks, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the show. We've got a great show tonight. With us on the podcast is Dr. Matthew Johnson, or Dr. J. Dr. J lives in the Pacific Northwest. He's a psychologist and one of the most respected members of the mental health field. This is a man with a lot more to lose than to gain by sharing his encounters. But Dr. Johnson had an encounter nearly 16 years ago at the Oregon Caves that really changed his life. So Dr. Johnson, welcome to the show. And if you wouldn't mind sharing your views on Sasquatch or Bigfoot prior to your encounter. Sure. Um, my background, I was um, raised in Salem, Oregon. Um, my father was an Oregon State Trooper. My mother, a high school attendance clerk. And um, I obtained a basketball scholarship to um, play ball at the University of Alaska at Anchorage. I, was, uh, I am six foot nine inches tall, and I was a lot skinnier then, but... Uh, I, I made all state and honorable mention all American as a high school athlete. I was one of the best hundred high school players in the country during my day. Got recruited by all the big schools until I injured my back with three games left to go to in season. So I ended up going up to Alaska, which was fine. We had the great Alaska shootout. Got to play college ball against guys like Michael Jordan, James Worthy, Patrick Ewing, Clyde Drexler, Kim Olajuwon, Spud Webb. Got half my picture in Sports Illustrated magazine. My silly teammate was in the way of the other half. Um, went on to, well, I obtained my bachelor's social work degree from the University of Alaska and then went on to Rutgers University in New Jersey and obtained my first master's degree, and that one was in social work with a minor in alcohol addiction studies. And while I was there, I was still in shape playing a lot of pickup ball, I was playing with a bunch of elite players and didn't realize I was playing pickup ball with a, an assistant coach from the New Jersey Nets who said, we want you to try out our team as a free agent. And I said, wow, thanks, but no thanks. He said, why not? I said, well, because you guys are the worst team in the NBA, and they were. They stopped them. And back then in the mid-'80s, bench warmers only got paid 75000 a year, which isn't the half million they get today. I'd I'd sit the bench for a half million, but not for 75000 And truth be told, that's what I would have been doing was sitting the bench. So, And the reality was I did get accepted into the doctor of psychology program out west, and that's where my future was. That's where my calling was, so that's where I went. So I moved back to the state of Oregon, got my second master's degree, this one in clinical psychology, and then my doctorate degree in clinical psychology from George Fox University. Afterwards, um, had a private practice going, wrote a parenting book, Positive Parenting with a Plan, spoke in 80 cities a year for over 10 years in all 50 states, most Canadian provinces, and at the um, World Family Therapy Conference in Europe where I train counselors from around the world. Um, I have four kids. Um, 
a dog, two cats. I have a private practice in Medford, Oregon. I'm still six foot nine. I weigh a lot more now. And um, I got into the Bigfooting stuff um, 16 years ago. So, Dr. J, of course, you grew up here in the uh, Pacific Northwest. I assume you've spent a great deal of time out in the outdoors, correct? I spent a total of 20 years living in Alaska. Um, and, yes, lots of outdoor activity, hiking, camping, fishing, some hunting. Um, a buddy and I got chased by a grizzly bear along the Russian River um, on one occasion. I had a moose stick its head through the sliding door. We opened up the sliding door in Anchorage and fed it carrots and celery while I was petting it. I chased a wolf, a black, beautiful jet black wolf across a frozen lake outside of Fairbanks on my snowmobile. Um, you know, I just, I'm very familiar with the outdoors. I wasn't a, a green bean city boy when I had my Bigfoot encounter on the mountain above the Oregon Caves. So if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing a little bit about that experience there at the Oregon Caves, kind of, you know, the background of the day and really what the setting was. Okay, well, as I just said, I put in 20 years of Alaska and... When I moved from Anchorage to Fairbanks, they said, welcome to the real Alaska, and boy, was it different. Anchorage is on the water. It's a more temperate climate, warmer than it is in the Great Lakes region of the, the U.S. Um, temperatures there are colder than they are in Anchorage, but when you get to Fairbanks, it is god-awful horrible. I drove out of Fairbanks in December of 1999. It was 100 below zero with the wind chill factor. Um, U-Haul truck broke down, almost froze to death if it hadn't been for an off-duty Alaska State Trooper going home but for work and running into me, I, I, I'd be dead. Um, so I eventually made it down to Oregon, started up a private practice, um, wife and kids followed up, and then we found ourselves six months later in July, July 1st, specific 2000, July 1st, 2000, and we decided to take the kids for a hike. Um, on the Big Tree Loop Trail after we toured the Oregon Caves. So it was a nice, sunny, hot day. We went through the caves tour. The, the caves are, you know, pretty chilly, so we got out and warmed up in the sun and pulled out a um, cooler out of the back of the car and sat at a picnic table and had a lunch. And then we were getting ready to, to go hike the trail. So we did. It was the Big Tree Loop Trail is 3.5 miles long. And most people go up the left side to see the big tree because it's a whole lot closer there. So they go up, see the big tree, come back down the left side. We went up the right side to start our journey, um, saving the big tree for the last part of the, the loop. So we went up the right side. We got about a mile up the mountain above the Oregon Caves, and um, we're still in park boundaries. And um the forest is really thick, um, lots of tall trees, lots of brush, very beautiful, very lush. And um, we were on the trail, and then we smelled this horrible stench coming downwind from the top of the mountain. Um, it got our attention. It smelled as strong as a skunk, but it wasn't a skunk. It was something different. Now, we weren't afraid because having lived in Alaska, um, there's a lot of scary animals up there, grizzly bear, wolves, etc. cetera. Um, we knew there were no grizzly bear in Oregon. We knew we were fine. So we kept hiking and got around a switch back and we we're going up the mountainside more and then all of a sudden something was paralleling us off the trail and, and we couldn't hear it stepping, but when we walked, um, it would make its noise. It was a deep bass mammal guttural whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And when we stopped, it stopped. When we walked, it did it again. When we stopped, it stopped. And I looked at my wife and the kids, and the kids at that time were ages nine, seven, and five. And I said, did you guys hear that? And they were, like, nodding their heads. And I, at first I thought it was, you know, just me sucking air and the blood vessels pounding by my eardrums. But I realized, no, this is not an internal sound. This is external. So we walked again, and it made the noise again. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And 
that's a bad imitation. If you heard what I was hearing, it, it would freak you out. And so eventually it stopped, and we hiked a little bit farther. And then, um, you know, ages nine, seven, and five, the kids wanted a little bit of a break, and they were being good hikers, good attitude, but okay, break time. And so they had a stick, and they were playing with the bug on the path, and Mother Nature was knocking on my door. So I hiked up off the trail through the brush and trees to go do my thing, took a pee, took a crap, um, pulled my, was pulling my pants back up, and I was looking down the slope. So I'm up above the trail, and we're on the slope, the side of a mountain, and I'm looking down the slope trying to see if whatever it was that was paralleling us is still in the area, and I look from my right to my left, and then that's when I saw something move, and I saw Bigfoot walk off the pages of myth and legend into reality, and it totally blew my mind. Um, I just, I could literally feel the cognitive schema in my brain come crashing down and my brain rebooting. Um, and when it rebooted, I had these very protective instincts kick in. And um, so I ran down through the brush and trees, got to the trail, and I ran up to my wife and kids and, and moved them along, away from the area, up the trail a couple hundred yards around a switchback. Didn't see anything following us, didn't hear anything following us, didn't smell anything. So I sat the kids down on a log, gave them some water, pulled my wife aside and said, you're not going to believe what I saw. And she said, what? And I said, I saw Bigfoot. And she said, I believe you. So we came up with a game plan to get off the mountain, decided not to go back down where we came from because the only thing we had to go with at that time was what do you do with the grizzly bear and you don't go back through the area where you saw him, you have to deviate around him. So we decided to complete the loop on the trail. They were ahead of me by about 75 to 100 feet because if anything was going to come up that hillside, it would run into me first, and I would run the interference. And I told her, if that happened, you guys run as fast as you can. Don't look back. But if that if that was going to happen, the kind of interference I would have run would have been brief and short-lived because – what I saw was two feet taller than me and a whole lot heavier than me, very buff and, and could have crumbled me up and thrown me away. And keep in mind everything I'm saying right now is is what I was thinking and, and feeling 16 years ago. Um, not It's not what I think and feel today 16 years later. Um, and there's... There's a whole lot I've learned since that time. Well, that's really fascinating, Dr. Johnson. You know, as you, you know, recapping that moment 16 years ago when you saw this creature looking at your family, you know, can you describe in as much detail as you can just really step by step what w what went through your mind as far as that cognitive crash and just exactly what that felt like? <laughs> well, I was trying to avoid the emotion. Um, it's really funny. Um, when I allow myself to feel the emotions, they're right there, and there's a whole lot of fear that goes with it, and it's like it's seared into my brain. Um there was a lot of fear. Um, I didn't have a gun. My wife and kids were on the trail. It was watching them. And there was nothing I could do to protect them. For over a month after that event happened, I had nightmares every night of seeing the Bigfoot tear my family apart on the trail. And I don't 
view them as dangerous today, 16 years later, and I don't have this emotion about them now when I'm out there in the field. Um, but I didn't know then what I know now. And the other thing that it took me 10 years to find the courage to finally speak up and share with somebody. Um, I didn't even share this with my wife then. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy out there in um, Bigfoot them and in divided camps about, you know, flesh and blood versus, you know, paranormal abilities and everything else. And um, what I didn't tell the media and what I didn't tell anybody else 16 years ago is that when I saw Bigfoot walk off the pages, myth and legend into reality, what I saw that traumatized me was not just seeing a Bigfoot. It was seeing a nine-foot-tall buff Bigfoot uncloak out of nowhere and walk over behind the tree and watch my wife and kid. And I was behind a natural blind up the hill, and he didn't see me. And when I ran down through the brush and the trees, after my brain rebooted, I told the media that I avoided eye contact with the Bigfoot because the only thing I had to go with was, what do you do with the grizzly bear? And you don't do the eye contact thing because they'll take it as a challenge and come after you. That's what I told the media because there was no way on God's green earth I was already risking my reputation or my private practice by coming out and saying I saw a Bigfoot. And I sure as hell was not going to say that I saw one uncloaked, nor was I going to tell them that when I ran down through the brush to the trail and it turned its head and looked at me with a, oh, shit, look on its face, where did you come from? Then he cloaked again. He just vanished. And I was left with how? Do I protect my family from that? How do I protect my family from a nine-foot squash that can uncloak and cloak again? How do I do that? And that scared me to death. And so for 10 years, I shoved that down in major denial. I didn't want to deal with it. And before Facebook, they had, you know, Whisper, email, email Whisper groups that you participated in, and if anybody brought up this stupid cloaking and mind speak and orbs and all this paranormal stuff, I would nail their butts to the wall and say, you're discrediting us serious researchers and you need to go crawl in a hole where you came from and don't come out and, you know, just go away. I didn't want to deal with it. I did not want to deal with it. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. And of course, you know, we've heard a lot of different theories between an ape and relic hominin. And I think at one point you even described the creature on that kind of two third continuum between ape and human. So I guess I'm just curious, you know, kind of now looking back, you know, at this encounter that happened 16 years ago and kind of thinking about, you know, how you framed that encounter in your mind and really what you thought it was. I was just curious, you know, what's different about your views today in that journey of Sasquatch and the phenomena that it is, and really kind of where are you at with it today? Well, um, real quick catch up from the past to today. So for the first 10 years, I stuffed, you know, what I saw. I denied what I saw, and I bought into the old school theory of descendants of Gigantopithecus, because that's what Krantz and Meldrum and Bender Nagel and Matt Moneymaker and the BFRO were promoting. And so that's what the mantra I repeated 
as I worked to remain in denial, but after 10 years of implementing old school research methods uh, with high tech equipment and I pulled a bazillion casts out of the ground, found bedding areas and scat piles and it was like, is this it? You know, they're close sometimes, but is this it? Am I going to put in 10, 20, 30 more years and do a Peter Byrne thing of, you know, all that time and effort and not really get any payoff out of it? Um, so then I started looking back at the habituators who were talking about go out there, sit down, talk, sing, play music, don't go after them, leave the high-tech equipment at home, and wait for them to come to you. And I thought, you know what, I gave it 10 years the other way. Why not give it, you know, some time this way? So I did. And I was in the Southern Oregon habituation area for the first four years as an old schooler. And then I switched during my fifth year there to the habituation method. And they didn't take my food for five years, but once they were convinced that I changed my approach, then they started taking my food, leaving fingerprints on the gifting bowls, um, coming into the perimeter of camp for vigils. Um, I brought lots of witnesses up there with me over nine years, 30 plus people who also um, saw the vigils on the perimeter of the base camp, witnessed fingerprints on the bulls, tracks in the area, hearing me on um, vocals and the spoken language. And um, eventually Adam Davies and John Carlson came with me in June of 2014, and they accidentally um, stumbled onto a portal in the area. And um, we opened that up two nights in a row, and that was witnessed by Adam Davies, John Carlson, myself, and my son. And then after that, it took me a year to figure out what we did to trigger it to open it up, and I finally figured it out. And then we reopened that portal on four separate occasions afterwards. So it was witnessed by six more people after that. Um, on Bigfoot is they're not descendants of Gigantopithecus, and I don't know about the alien connection, and I'm not saying it's not possible. I just haven't seen it. But certainly, I'm a whole lot more open to what they could be than I ever was. Yeah, I find it uh, pretty fascinating. You know, we've uh, interviewed a lot of the folks in the in the uh, tribes here, in in yeah, I find it really fascinating. Um, you know, we've interviewed a lot of people here in the tribes and in the First Nations up in Canada. And uh, even know uh, a tribal elder there in the uh, Blackfoot Nation there in Idaho. And uh, a lot of them kind of consider, you know, Sasquatch or Bigfoot to be this kind of, you know, forest spirit or protector of the natural world. And, um, you know, there are many stories about them being kind of a forest deity or spirit and an interdimensional traveler. And so I'm just curious, you know, about the portal and, and kind of really what you've seen. I saw one walk out of the portal three months later in September of 2014. So they used the portals. Um, the what we saw, um, Adam Davies and John Carlson, myself and my son, was when the portal opened up in June of 2014. It opened up to a realm with red sky and dark scraggly vegetation. Um, I don't know if that was another dimension, another planet, um, but it certainly wasn't Earth that we were looking at. And there were also two little three-foot-tall guardians with glowing red eyes that if you listen to my audio recording in my SoundCloud on Team Squatch and USA SoundCloud files, you'll hear live recording of from those nights of Adam Davies and John Carlson freaking out and Adam talking like he's going to die. So when you opened this portal, how, how did you go about opening a portal? Well, like I said, Adam Davies and John Carlson accidentally triggered it. It took me a year to figure out what happened. 
but what I eventually figured out was that we had gone to the Oregon House of Mystery, the Oregon Vortex, earlier that day on the third night we were there, the third day we were there. And somehow, some way, by spending an hour there going through their tour, we ended up going back to the base camp with some kind of residual energy. And that energy is what triggered the portal. Now, when you think about it, um, there are lots of stories of the Squatches draining batteries. And when um, myself and Cynthia and uh, another buddy of mine were out bigfooting one time, we had a Squatch approach us, eight foot tall, cloaked along the way. You could still see the foot tracks coming toward us and the ferns moving and the branches moving up to eight feet off the ground. And I stood up, it walked by me, bumped my left shoulder, spun me around like a little kid, and then walked past me into the brush and the trees. And you could see everything moving as that cloak being went by. Now, when it went by, it lit up myself, Cynthia's, and Howie's central nervous system. So whatever energy it was using the cloak was um, definitely um, charging us up. So, and, and then they also like to move along power line trails. And I think they don't just do that because it's easy to travel through there because the brush and trees are cut out. But I also think that they like, you know, being near the power grid. So I think there's something about energy that they're utilizing, and they use themselves to open up and close the portal. Well, we went to the Oregon Vortex and came back with some juju, some energy, and that is what triggered opening up the portal. And, and once I did that, once I figured that out, I had a group of people with me, and I said, you're going to have to trust me. I, I want to do an experiment with you guys. Nobody's in danger. And they all agreed, so we went to the Oregon Vortex. The Oregon House of Mystery came back to camp, and we reopened the portal that night. So in terms of the, you know, Sasquatch that you've encountered, has it ever crossed your mind that potentially this is the same Sasquatch and it's potentially following you or has some sort of connection to you? Um, you know, I, I, have, I don't think that the Squatch that I ran into at the Oregon Caves is um, the same, from the same family as the one in the Southern Oregon habituation area. And um, as you know, that um, camp got crashed in December of last year, and the um, GPS coordinates were posted online for the world to see. And at that time, um, the family that was there, the adolescent male, um, I know this sounds weird, but I don't have any reason to make this crap up. I don't have any reason to lie or hoax. When I say something happened, I'm, I'm not lying. I'm not saying it happened. And, you know, people accused me of that when I talked about the portal during my conference last year. Well, let us hear the tapes. Let us hear the tapes. So Adam Davies, you know, and John Carlson do an interview on the radio, and then it's crap. They're backing, you know, Dr. J up. Um, maybe he is telling the truth, or or they go, maybe Adam Davies um, and John Carlson were on drugs or something. You know, anything but believe it. Yeah, and I guess, you know, if you think about the Native Americans and, you know, these stories that, you know, Sasquatch is this, you know, protector of the natural world, you know, it really starts to resonate. When the site got crashed, um, I had a a dream that night, a vision in my dream from the adolescent male who told me his name was Seska, and he said, we're taking you to a new area, and he gave me a vision of where to go. It was the place I'd been to 12 years earlier, and in my dream with this vision, I'm arguing with him, well, what about over here? This is a nice place. And he goes, no, go here. And I, well, what about over there? Because that place over there, no, go here. And I'm like, okay, I'll go there. So. I went there a couple of days later with another friend, and they said, if you go here, we'll guide you. So we 
we drove there. And we started driving. We went up the mountain, up the mountain, up the mountain, and down this dead-end road. And um, Jill wanted to get out and check out the area. It didn't look very squatchy to me, but I got out after I turned the truck around. And sure enough, there were snap trees and a large track on the side of the mountain and some woven sticks. And I thought, okay, maybe they passed through here, but this isn't really where I want to establish a base camp. So we were driving back out the dead end road, and on the way back out, there were two torn branches, freshly torn branches, placed on the road that were not there when we drove in, but they were waiting for us as we drove back out. So that was cool. And that kind of stuff happened in the previous camp a lot. So we kept driving around, driving around, driving around, and then I had to turn myself around on another dead end logging road. This time, Jill had to get out of the truck to make sure I didn't go over the edge while I was inching my way around. When I finally got the truck turned around, killed the engine, so I'm still sitting in the driver's seat. Jill's standing outside the driver's door, and all of a sudden we hear down the slope from the logging road, stomp, 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 four very loud stomps. And I see this very tall tree that's about six, eight inches around get pulled back, and then she turns her head. And we both see it get pushed over right in front of our faces. It was not wind. It was not snow. And this thing was pulled and then shoved over the other way. So that was confirmation that we're in the right spot. We found a lot of tracks there. And so we were excited. And we found what we thought would make a great base camp. So we're driving out. And on the way out, I stopped the truck, get out and get on the road because I wanted to take a couple of pictures to send to my fiance Cynthia to show her the vision, the scenery that was given to me in my dream so she could actually see what I saw during the vision of my dream. So I snapped three pics really quick, 1001, 1002. I always take several pics hoping one will come out. I got home after that and looked at the pics in the, in the first pic in the distance, up in the sky, you see an orb. The second pick, it's halfway down toward me. Third pick, the orb is up close and personal. That thing traveled really far, really fast in just two seconds while I clipped, while I snapped that on camera three times. And that was like the icing on the cake for the confirmation that you know, I was being moved to the right area. Since then, I've done day trips, and we've had visuals and vocals, orbs, um, lots of tracks, lots of trees where I'm being rearranged. Um, really, lots of tree wax. It's, it's an awesome place. And I think we're moving from habituation to um, interaction. And we're pretty excited about it, and we're going to go out there this weekend for um, three nights. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we'd love to hear what happens there. So, you know, when this creature had uncloaked, what did that look like? And what did it look like when it when it cloaked itself back again? Did it just appear out of thin air, or was there a gradual transition into your visual realm? No, it was fast. There was nothing was there, and then all of a sudden there it was. It maybe took a second to transition from nothing to something very solid and visual. Keep in mind, in September of 2011, um, when Cynthia and myself and Howie saw the Squatch walk toward us that was cloaked, that wasn't cloaked and then cloaked along the way, when I stood up, I could see the tracks going by me. I could see the ferns moving, but I couldn't see it. And it still bumped me and spun me around. So even though it was cloaked and we couldn't see it, it was still physically solid. That's it fascinating. Hit me and bumped me around. By the way, we don't know if there's a portal in this new area. So one of the things we are going to do is go back to the Oregon House of Mystery, the Oregon Vortex, and get ourselves all jujued up with residual energy and head back to the new area, and then we're going to walk the roads 
in the dark to see if we can trigger a portal if one is there. Um, we will be armed with flashlights, which sounds kind of funny, but um, that's what shut down the other portal is the right white light. So if we um, open up something that we don't want to, um, we can shut it down. Yeah, we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, before you joined, you know, we were watching your uh, SOA, Southern Oregon habituation video, and uh, you were just kind of uh, kind of in a cot next to the SUV, and you had mentioned you were carrying a forty four Magnum, and I always laugh because I tell Paul, I'd, you know, much rather run into a bear than a creepy dude in the woods, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about just, you know, habituation, kind of what your tactics are, and, uh, you know, are you there out in the open, are you sleeping in the SUV? Are you by yourself, or you know, do you have other folks there with you? So, oh, and uh, by the way, it's been twenty-five years, and <laughs> I still won't go out solo. <laughs> so, um, actually, I kind of cheated a little bit. I went out with my four-year-old boy instead of adult man, but um, still, it was just me as an adult, and we were in the tent, and um, and I got approached from behind the tent and got zapped and did a mind speak thing with the adolescent male and eventually with his um father um and so that that blew my mind after that i went out by myself and um i was solo no kid i had my little dog with me a seven pound toy fox terrier atlas and um the i was in a tent still and i heard the garbage bag which was anchored by the camp stove on the table about 20 feet away from the tent get lifted up camp stove put back down then the garbage bag was being dragged across the ground towards the tent and it's not like it was so heavy that he couldn't carry the garbage bag he was dragging it to get my attention to make the noise then he he kind of brushed the front of my tent with the garbage bag my little dog was sleeping on top of the sleeping bag down by my feet he ran up to my head and dove inside the sleeping bag then the Squatch picked up the garbage bag, dragged it in front of the tent a second time. Then he picked it up and dragged it in front of the tent a third time. And then he, um, you know, dragged it across the road and then walked away. Well, the next morning when the sun rose and I got out of my tent, I went in the direction of where the garbage bag was drugged, and he tied it to a tree and walked Actually away. Actually tied it to a tree. He tied it to a tree. The little twisty ties at the end, he tied it to the tree. So I I interpreted that as he wanted me to come out of my tent, so I did, because that freaked me out. I started sleeping in the back of the Suburban. And so I was sleeping in the back of the Suburban with my little boy, and um, in the middle of the night around 2 in the morning, I woke up because I thought I heard somebody knocking on the window, but then I fell right back to sleep because I was exhausted. Well, I record all night long with my parabolic microphone dish. I record for like 10, 12 hours, which means I have a lot of audio to listen to when I get back home. Well, I recorded that garbage bag being dragged to the tent, and that's in my SoundCloud files. But I also recorded what happened this night. And sure enough, come walking into camp, messing with stuff on the table, and then knocking on my window of my suburban. I, you know, there it was. So I figured after dragging the garbage bag in front of the tent, knocked on the window of the suburban, they wanted us to start sleeping outside. So I started sleeping outside in the open on a cot. And yes, I do carry a 44 Meg, and it's not for the squatches, it is for. Um, black bear, cougars, and stupid human beings, and mainly for stupid human beings. <laughs> um, so, go ahead. You, well, did you get the sense that this creature was more human-like or more like an animal? So, in other words, when you saw it move, did it more human? So, did it seem to have, uh, you know, a, a sense of purposeful intelligence not, as yeah. opposed to just an instinctual animal? Yeah. They're intelligent, very intelligent. They they have a spoken language. They they sing. They um, interact. They live in family groups. Family groups belong to clans. They can cloak. They can come in and out through portals. I guarantee you they're smarter than we are. I don't recall any one of us 
operating portals and going through portals or we can cloak or we can zap or we can engage in mind speak like they can. They're actually smarter than we are. And I think it's humorous when people think they're just dumb giant mountain apes. And and when when you're talking and I also made a YouTube video about this recently, Bigfoot does not exist. And I poke fun at people who hold on to the theory of descendants of Gigantopithecus, because that Bigfoot does not exist. Anyone looking for that Bigfoot in the woods, flesh and blood, giant dumb mountain ape, is looking for something that does not exist. They're looking for unicorns. They're wasting their time. Now, what do you think, that when you saw those orbs, what do you think the orbs actually represent? I don't know yet. To be quite honest, I don't know yet. Um, I don't, you know, there's theories of it's the squatches turning into orbs or it's their drone to check things out so they can see things through the orbs. But the reality is all there is is a lot of theories and speculations about what the orbs are and, and how they're used. All I know is I've seen them along with other witnesses and they're associated with the squatches, and that's it. That's all I can tell you. So so when you heard that creature make those sounds, those, that huffing or that woofing sound, did it seem that it was out of breath, or is it, do you think that was some way of, of signaling you, or, or why do you think it was actually making that sound? He was definitely letting us know that he was there. I think he was trying to initiate some kind of contact, but you need to keep in mind 16 years ago, it wasn't like I was some Bigfoot researcher. I didn't even think about it since like childhood when I read a book about Bigfoot and UFOs and ghosts from, you know, checking out from the school library. Um, so I think he was just trying to initiate contact. And, and for the record, um, looking back, you know, from this angle to what happened above the Oregon case, we were never, ever in danger at, at all. And the emotion that got seared into my brain from that event 16 years ago does not reflect the way I feel today and my knowledge and experience level today after 16 years. Um, so I was terrified back then because I knew nothing. Um, and that, that the emotion from that encounter still lives with me to today. But, you know, when I'm out there now, I have no problem going out by myself. And they're not dangerous. And people who promote fear cells, fear cells, and people buy fear. It's in the media. It's in our newspapers. It's in movies, it's in 411 books, um, fear cells. People like fear. They buy fear. They pay for fear. They want to hear fear. They want to hear that Bigfoot's a big, bad, mean monster that can eat you up. But he's not. They're not. Still there, or did I lose you? No, we're still here. Yeah, I'm okay. just done. This has been one, really, truly one of the most riveting encounters that I think I have absolutely ever heard. It must have been a, a really big relief when you finally had the, the courage to talk about that creature uncloaking and, and cloaking back. I was at Toby Johnson Sasquatch Symposium outside of Eugene, Oregon in, I believe, 2011. And um, I was one of the speakers at that conference, and then Tom Powell um, spoke after me. And he was talking about some of the paranormal stuff. And um, he got my attention. I was in the front row. I was leaning forward. I was all ears. And he could tell that he was saying stuff that was getting to me. So he was kind of doing, you know, looking at me and talking with me a couple times throughout his presentation. And, and then it was time for lunch. So Cynthia and I went, you know, along with everybody else to the lunchroom. And we were sitting at the table and eating. And, the people across from us were done. They got up and left, and then Tom Powell came over and sat down across from me and looked at me, and it was like he was looking into my soul. And 
And he goes, so what really happened on that mountain above the Oregon caves? What aren't you telling us? You know? And I'm like, oh, crap. He, he knows. And I said, you know what, Tom? I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to take Cynthia outside and tell her first because I've never told anybody anything, and she's going to be the first one I tell before I tell you. Well, is there anything else that, that you'd like to share with us about your encounter? They, as I mentioned earlier, language, and they interact and they engage in mind speak. Um, recently, in October of last year, at the old SOA, I felt like they were moving me out of the area. It was like they knew that the area was going to be crashed before I knew it. And um, I have been asking for a teacher for a number of years. Can I have a teacher? Can you give me a teacher? I'd love to have an elder be a teacher. I want to learn more. Can you give me a teacher? Please give me a teacher. For a long time, I've been asking for that. And um, finally, I got a real strong mind speak a voice inside the head, no, I'm not going psychotic or schizophrenic. And um, the voice said, you're our teacher. That's why we bring our kids to the base camp, so they can listen and learn from you and your friends. Because we talk about things, we play music, we entertain them. Um, they learn a lot from us, and so they said, you're our teacher. And then they gave me a kind of sensory or guardian to stand guard at night while I'm sleeping, which I know sounds crazy, but again, I have no reason to make this crap up. Um, when I was up there in October with um, Andrea Billups, she's a journalist with all kinds of experience for national publications and did presidential campaigns and teaches journalism at the University of Florida, so she's no flaky individual. And um, we were up there, and our cots were together, and we had the tarp halfway up the cots. In case it started raining, we could pull the top tarp over our heads and stay dry. So middle of the night, um, I'm kind of awake. I have my stocking cap on my head and over my eyes. I have this quirky thing that I have to have my eyes covered by either a stocking cap or a T-shirt, or I can't sleep at night. And so all of a sudden, I feel... Some raindrops starting, starting to sprinkle, and then the tarp gets pulled from my waist up to my shoulder on the first tug, and the second tug it gets pulled over my head, third tug all the way to the ground. And I said, Andrea, did you just pull the tarp over us? No answer. So I feel over in her cot with my hand, she's not there. So I lift the tarp up and I look at the portable toilet behind the cots at the head of the cots to see if she's using it. She's not there. Next thing going through my head is sitting across the table from the Josephine County Sheriff's trying to convince them that I didn't bury her body anywhere. So now I'm going, Andrea, Andrea, where are you? And she is a real small woman, and she's all curled up at the bottom of her sleeping bag, and she goes, I'm right here, Matt. And I said, did you pull that tarp over our heads? And she said, no, I, I just woke up. So it had just started to rain, and my sentry, the guardian that I was assigned, pulled the tarp over us to keep us dry. There were tracks on the ground behind the head of my cot. In November, just a month later of last year, Mike and Kate and I are up there, and I'm sleeping on my cot. I'm facing my truck. I'm only five feet away from my truck. I have the parabolic microphone dish on top of the cab of the truck. Again, I record all night long. I'm recording 10, 12, sometimes 14 hours all night long. And I wake up around 4 in the morning, and I have the stocking cap over my eyes. And in my mind, I ask my sentry, the guardian, I ask, are you still there? Then there are these footsteps that come over the side of my cot. He leans over my ear. I'm laying on my left side facing the truck. He whispers into my right ear, yes, right here beside you. Well, immediately I pulled my stocking cap up from over my eyes, and he's not there. He's cloaked, and he walks back to the head of my cot. I look at my watch. It's 4.05 in the morning. I knew I started recording at 8 p.m. the night before, 
So when I went home, I took that particular recording, fast forwarded eight hours and five minutes into it, and guess what I got? Yes, right here beside you in a squatchy language. He's not dumb. He's not dumb. He knew he was being recorded. He could have responded to me with the mind speak back because I didn't ask verbally. I asked in my mind, are you still there? He could have responded in mind speak, but he chose to walk beside me in front of that parabolic microphone dish and recorder, lean over my ear and whisper audibly so he could be recorded, yes, right here beside you. That's in SoundCloud. That's there. And I know it sounds crazy, but it really happened. You know, we, we, we hear that a lot, that they want to, you know, if they want to be heard or want to be seen, um, you know, they do so. So there must be some type of trust you've established uh, along your path. Oh, most definitely. On one of my solos when I was up there, um, he approached the side of my tent, and I had my 44 meg laying on the floor of my tent. So when I stretched out my arm and hand, it would be right there on the grip and the trigger. And so I, I put my hand on the grip and the trigger, and the mind speak was, take your hand off the gun. So I did, and he got closer, and I put my hand back on the, the grip and the trigger, and he said, take your hand off the gun. So I took it off, and then he zapped me. And then he proceeded to run me through the memories from earlier that day of being at the store buying bread, peanut butter, and jelly, putting the sandwiches together, putting the gifting bowls out, and he asked me the question, what are your intentions? Well, I was a little PO'd. I'd been up there for years. Really, you're going to ask me that question? So he ran me through the memories a second time, and then he asked the same question, what are your intentions? Well, now I'm really PO'd because, dude, really, I've been up here all this time. You're going to ask me. He runs me through the memories a third time. And he says, what are your intentions? So I answered him in my mind. I said, to earn your trust and friendship. And then I heard, thank you. But I didn't just hear, thank you. I felt his emotions, his emotions, behind his expression of thank you. I felt his joy, his happiness, kind of like Spock with a Vulcan mind meld where he, you know, does the emotions in the memories. I felt his joy along with hearing it. And so for him, it was important to know my intentions and to know that it was to earn his trust and friendship. And after that experience, which happened a couple of years ago, things went crazy wild as far as interactions and sightings and everything else that's been going on. They want that connection, but trust is important. And if we go out into the field and we're full of fear, they'll keep their distance from us because Humans do stupid things when we're afraid. We shoot things and blow things up. So if we want them to come in closer to us and interact with us, then we have to show them nothing but trust, put the fear away. And the way you do that, and this is now coming from a psychologist, if you've had numerous experiences out there in the forest and you've managed to wake up alive every morning, even though they've been close by, you must ultimately conclude that they're not dangerous. Because if they were, you would have woken up dead one of those mornings, and you never did wake up dead. You always right. woke up alive. So putting fear aside, putting trust out there, leave the high-tech equipment at home, let them know that you want to earn their trust and friendship, sing, laugh, juggle, play instruments, put gifting bowls out away from camp, turn off the lights, no lanterns, no flashlights, no campfires, keep your camp dark. Go out there with few people, not large groups of people, and things will start to happen if you do it consistently. Well, Dr. Johnson, this has been a fantastic hour. Uh, thank you so much for for joining us today. Would you share with us, um, you know, Chuck and I will uh, touch base with you after your um, trip this weekend to hopefully hear about some more encounters. Can we count on you for that? Sure, you can count on me talking with you. You can reach out to me, I'll let you know. I can't guarantee you what they're gonna do this weekend. 
I, I can only hope or speculate that it's just going to be awesome based on everything that's happened so far, but, you know, we'll see. And, sure, I'd love to talk with you again. That'd be fantastic. Well, I've really enjoyed myself, and it's been fantastic meeting you, and look forward to the next time we speak. Yeah, and just a reminder for the listeners that Dr. Johnson and Team Squatch in USA will be holding the second annual Bigfoot Interaction Conference. It will be held April 22nd through 24th at the Baymont Inn and Suites in Bremerton, Washington. You can get your tickets at teamsquatchinusa.com, and it should be a fantastic event. So more on interacting, more on habituation, and a lot of fantastic guests. So Dr. Johnson, thanks again for coming on Sasquatch Syndicate. We really do appreciate it, and I know our listeners do as well. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. This concludes our April 2016 podcast. Sasquatch Syndicate will return on Sunday, May 1st. Thanks to all our listeners and those that have been out to our website and those following us on social media. Sasquatch is a controversial subject, so for all the believers and disbelievers and those that will tell you they have all the answers, just remember, we're flying through space at 700 miles per hour. Buckle up.